Okay, if you've been following along, we just completed our overview of a few renal function tests that are useful in the setting of acute kidney injury, or AKI. Remember, AKI is just a fancy term used for the rise in creatinine and decreased urine output that occurs when a patient suffers from acute renal dysfunction. AKI does not mean we know the cause. In our last sketch, we outlined prerenal, intrinsic renal, and postrenal forms of AKI. Prerenal AKI occurs when the kidney is hypoperfused, postrenal when the distal urinary tract is obstructed. For the next few videos, however, we're going to look at various causes of intrinsic AKI. In other words, we're doing some kind of direct damage to the nephron or the parenchyma surrounding it, ultimately leading to reduced filtration and, usually, a measurable increase in serum creatinine. By far, the most common cause of intrinsic AKI is acute tubular necrosis. Yes, I said necrosis. It was a foggy, dreary night, and a group of four friends from the local junior high school snuck into the nearby abandoned amusement park. Armed with only a super soaker, sock of boppers, moon shoes, and um, various other early 90s memorabilia. The bop it, maybe? they took it upon themselves to find their missing friend. Though he'd only been missing for one week, the authorities had given up the search. <sighs> Not them, though. They just know that something strange is going on here. I mean, just look at this place. You see that rusty, necrotic drain pipe with mud pouring out of it? It's supposed to evoke an image of acute tubular necrosis, a condition that involves acute renal dysfunction due to death and necrosis of renal tubule cells. ATN is the most common form of acute kidney injury, accounting for about 45% of all cases of AKI. In fact, more than 10% of ICU patients develop ATN at some point, with that figure doubling to 20% of patients with sepsis and over 50% of patients with septic shock. In other words, you're going to encounter ATN a lot. But what's causing the tube to get all gross and necrotic like that? Well, in the overwhelming majority of cases, the tubule cells are getting ischemic. In this scene, tubular ischemia will be represented by a <gasps> It's a, is that a, it's eyes. Do you think I should, I mean, I could pop it back in or, I know, I'll just, I'll, I'll soak him. As you can see, that water gun is running a little low on volume. Look closely and you'll notice that front canister there looks just like a kidney, empty and poorly perfused. That's because ATN usually occurs in the setting of impaired kidney perfusion, which leads to ischemia of the renal parenchyma. Yes, yes, I know. It seems only minutes ago we concluded that pre-renal AKI, not intrinsic AKI, occurs in the setting of reduced kidney perfusion. Remember that hemorrhage of ketchup and floppy heart failure balloon from the fast food restaurant? Here's the thing though. If this low flow state is severe or prolonged, a prerenal AKI turns into an intrinsic AKI. In other words, we start doing ischemic damage directly to that tubule. That's when acute tubular necrosis sets in. On the test, the clinical scenario will involve an episode of extreme systemic hypoperfusion. Something like, a 40-year-old man is rushed to the ER after a motor vehicle accident, suffering several fractures and internal bleeding. He's stable after surgery and is transferred back to your floor. On the second post-op day, uh-oh, he's not peeing. He's oliguric, that is, and his creatinine is on the rise. That's kidney dysfunction, my friends, possibly due to that severe episode of blood loss and hypoperfusion causing ischemic damage to the kidney. Really, keep in mind any major surgery that involves lots of blood loss and prolonged hypotension. Even something like severe hypotension caused by septic shock, for example. Any kind of shock, really. Severe, prolonged hypotension is commonly seen in ICUs secondary to sepsis, cardiac failure, or over-treatment of hypertension. Think of MI as well. A 60-year-old man goes into cardiac arrest, but you resuscitate him because you're awesome like that. On the second day of recovery, it's always like the next day, by the way. He stops peeing. Uh-oh. AKI much? There's a huge drop in cardiac output during an MI, remember. So think of ischemic kidney injury to those tubes. 
it's not just the tubular cells that are affected by this hypoxic state, by the way. Okay, we've got another zombie. He's here to remind you that the vasculature feels the ischemia too. The endothelial cells lining the afferent arterioles are damaged, leading to diminished nitric oxide production and an increase in endothelin. Just think of this nitric oxide exhaust pipe, all damaged and constricted, unable to produce that sweet gaseous nitric oxide crucial for proper vasodilation. So as you can see, we've got vasoconstriction. Yeah, he's a goner. Really should have rethought the long sleeves. This impedes afferent blood flow to the glomerulus. Hence the park attendees there, stuck at the afferent park entrance. <sighs> Gray flesh should have purchased a fast pass. Decreased flow to the glomerulus means a decreased GFR. That's a measure of the kidney's filtration ability, remember. And it's sketchy, GFR is represented by coffee filtration, grounds filtration rate, if you will. And as you can tell, our GFR isn't doing so hot. The GFR is really getting attacked on both sides, however. Let me show you what I mean. When the hypoxia hits the nephron, eventually renal tubular cells undergo apoptosis and slough off right into the lumen. This leaves behind the characteristic granular muddy brown casts that can be seen in the urine sediment. Hence the muddy epithelial leaves scattered in that puddle there. Not only that, all those sloughed cells accumulate in the tubular lumen, causing obstruction, just like this big clump of dead leaves here, sitting in the gutter. This sends pressure backwards to the glomerulus, further reducing GFR. <clears throat> Need my opener. I suffer from OCD, obsessive coffee disorder. <laughs> Come closer, I want to bite your face. Ischemic injury predominantly affects the renal medulla, which has low blood supply even under normal conditions. Specifically, the straight portion of the proximal tubule and the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle are particularly susceptible to hypoxia. So let's draw in a sign for the pro cart track above that dilapidated bumper car area. It's our recurring theme for the proximal convoluted tubule. And while we're at it, let's sketch in another ischemic zombie over here reaching up toward that roller coaster. Those ascending cars headed up the loop-de-loop -loop should remind you of the ascending loop of Henley. Both the proximal convoluted tubule and the ascending loop of Henley are susceptible to ischemia because they participate in active transport of ions. So they crave ATP, and you can't make much ATP without oxygen. Changes to the tubular cells in these areas can be seen microscopically as the ischemia evolves. Take a look for yourself. You see the lumen of that rusty, necrotic tube? Notice that only parts of it are lined with epithelial cells. In the setting of ATN, a histological section of the nephron will reveal dilated tubules with a patchy loss of its epithelial lining. Not only that, you can also see rupture of the basement membrane, as well as vacuolization of the irreversibly damaged epithelial cells. It'll look like a bunch of little holes are opening up around each tubule cross-section. All right, let's back up a bit and follow the entire course of acute tubular necrosis from beginning to end. There are actually three stages common to all cases of ATN. First, the initiation phase. Think of it as the come on in stage. This is when the initial insult occurs, whether it be MI, sepsis, hemorrhage, etc. It usually lasts about 36 hours, and during this time, kidney function and urine output remain fairly normal. The creatinine and electrolyte profile remain fairly stable as well, and oftentimes the developing kidney injury is overshadowed by the causative disease process itself. So that's why we put the smiling clown face up there. The kidney seems to be doing A-OK. -okay. Recall a few of the clinical scenarios we illustrated at the beginning of the sketch. That post-trauma, or post-MI, or post-op patient didn't start to show AKI symptoms until the next day. At this point, AKI starts to rear its ugly head, leading to severe metabolic derangements and reduced urine output. This symptomatic phase is called the maintenance phase. So we'll illustrate a few of the clinical consequences of AKI around this creepy, rundown maintenance shed. The maintenance phase typically lasts for one to two weeks after an initial insult, and it's marked by severely decreased urine output, rapidly rising creatinine, fluid overload, and metabolic abnormalities. By the way, 
Whenever we want you to think of the clinical manifestations associated with acute kidney injury, we'll include a cracked kidney, like the one on the door here. Recall from our fast food renal function sketch that acutely diminished GFR leads to azotemia. That's just a fancy way of saying BUN and creatinine are accumulating in the serum. So we've included a creatinine credit card slot on the broken down GFR coffee machine, as well as our recurring BUN fast food bag, littered on the ground. AKI will also manifest as decreased urine output, or oliguria, hence that oliguric trickle of water there. This usually means less than 400 milliliters of urine produced in 24 hours. And whatever little urine is made will contain those characteristic, granular, muddy brown casts. Remember, too, all those classic histologic changes we can see under light microscopy, including vacuolization and loss of the epithelial cells lining the tubule. During the maintenance stage, you can also expect to find a few of the typical metabolic and electrolyte abnormalities associated with AKI. This includes hyperkalemia, acidosis, hypertension, uremia. This will all be covered in the Chronic Kidney Dinosaur Museum at the end of this chapter, so stay tuned. Following the maintenance phase, which is most often treated with conservative measures, the recovery phase begins. Remember, this is about one to two weeks after that initial insult to the kidney. During this time, the tubular epithelium starts to regenerate along the nephron. This is called tubular reepithelialization, and it's depicted by this girl here as she covers up her friend, epithelializes him, if you will, as they make their escape. These immature tubular cells, however, aren't fully functional yet. Specifically, they are not very good at reabsorbing. See his crotch? <laughs> I would have responded the same way. I mean, all that coffee and then add zombies on top of that? <sighs> That is a recipe for some profound diuresis. In the recovery phase of ATN, urine output may even reach levels of 3 to 5 liters per day. The production of such massive amounts of dilute, hypoconcentrated urine can lead to further electrolyte abnormalities. Most importantly, hypokalemia, hyponatremia, hypocalcemia, and hypomagnesemia. It's all shown here, falling out of that overturned trash can. Potassium banana peels, salty sodium peanuts, calcium ice cream cups, and magnesium magazines, diluted and excreted. Remember, these electrolyte disturbances will happen a couple weeks after that initial kidney injury. So watch out. Hypokalemia is an especially serious complication because it can cause fatal arrhythmias. All right, while ischemia is, by far, the most common cause of acute tubular necrosis, it's important to also keep nephrotoxic ATN in mind. This occurs when some kind of substance, such as a drug or a contrast agent, exerts direct toxicity to tubular cells, as opposed to hypoxia and ischemic damage. It's like this toxic waste here, spilling over and exerting some direct damage to that pro-cart track. This is all happening at the track specifically because the proximal convoluted tubule is the primary site of damage. It's the first segment of the nephron that the toxin touches. Now, there are numerous pharmacological agents that can cause nephrotoxic AKI, and you may remember a few of them from Sketchy Farm. Throughout our farm course, we would emphasize nephrotoxicity by including our recurring cracked AKI kidney somewhere in the scene. This time, these nephrotoxic drugs will be depicted by the various zombie-fighting accoutrements carried by our last kid, swinging in to save the day. <sighs> and they always made fun of Brayden for practicing with his psi weapons every day after school. Aminoglyco size, that is. And sure, he may have been a little more portly than the other kids. That bucket of chicken always tucked under his arm. Seriously, though, he can be quite nimble at times. That bucket of chicken, by the way, should remind you of damaged muscle, which can occur from a crush injury or rhabdomyolysis. Not so bad until... ha -cha! Ninja stealth sure can strike. It releases a bunch of nephrotoxic heme pigments into the bloodstream. Yep, heme-shaped zombie killing stars? Check. And the last crucial piece of equipment? His matching yin-yang white satin jacket, baby. Boom shakalaka. You know he only puts that on for stalking the night. Slaying the army of the undead. That contrast between the white and black on the yin-yang? That stands for IV contrast agents, my friend. You know. The stuff they inject to enhance blood vessels and highlight tissue structures during a CT scan? 
Well, contrast-induced nephropathy is the leading cause of hospital-acquired acute kidney injury. So think twice about administering it to your patients with already poor renal function. Within 24 to 48 hours, look for creatinine to be on the rise and that urine output to drop. Remember, though, creatinine and oliguria are a sign of AKI, but they do not tell us about the cause of AKI. So keep in mind all those other clues that will point you toward acute tubular necrosis specifically, such as that characteristic history of severe volume depletion or toxic drug administration, along with those classic muddy casts in the urine sediment. For our next video, we're continuing our theme of intrinsic renal damage with acute interstitial nephritis, a condition that involves inflammation of the renal parenchyma. I hate to say it, but I think we're going to just have to find a hiding spot and wait it out till morning, guys. I have an idea, though. Now, hear me out. At the break of dawn, we're going to get the inflammation going and light this place on fire. Okay. I guess I was anticipating a more excited response. I'm, um open to suggestions.